Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your standing ovation. But you do understand that you only make me more nervous than I was before. <laughs> I wrote down my speech and I wanted to start with the polite and common it's a great privilege to be here to speak at Hillsdale College National Leadership Seminar, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, then, and then I got this incredible opportunity to sit next to a man who, I have to admit, reminds me of the pictures of Father Christmas. <laughs> maybe a little thinner and a little smaller. <laughs> and he gives me this wonderful Christmas present in the middle of May. I just got myself a scholarship. <laughs> and I've been told by Father Christmas that he listened to me speak in New York and there were, in the politest way that he can do it, holes in my knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to fill them. <laughs> and if I get an A, Dr. Arn is going to put a thousand dollars into the Ayan Hirsi Ali AHA Foundation. And I think that's work, worth working for. And I'm supposed to learn about the American Constitution, the history of the American Constitution, American literature and English, all in just one month. <laughs> that, I am told, is how intensely you work at Hillsdale. I'm in for it. <laughs> I was in a panic before I came here because your seminar sent me a list of the former speakers and it went like Margaret Thatcher, <laughs> Ronald Reagan, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and my friend and colleague Lynn Cheney is here and I was like, gosh, I'm just never, I'm, I, I can't do this. <laughs> um, but I'm here to talk to you about, I was asked to talk about the clash of civilizations, not because I'm shaped by my political experience or my literary experience, unlike presidents and prime ministers, like Mrs. Thatcher and President Reagan, these are individuals who were elected on the merits of their political acumen and succeeded as decision makers in very dramatic conflicts because of their exceptional personal character, their clear visions on what they stood for and what they were against, on their excellent skills to work towards the objectives they had set for themselves. I was a politician in Holland for three and a half years and I know that it takes courage and perseverance and a certain kind of toughness to achieve political goals in a democratic society. But in sharing my views with you on the conflict between Islam and the West, I rely not so much on experience as a politician or a leader in the classical sense of founding an organization, whether it's government or private, but on my personal experience, my observations, and on the observations and insights of those who have studied this conflict for years and who have left us their work, even if it's from centuries ago. And there are holes in my knowledge in that. <laughs> Last year, my publisher, Simon & Schuster's Free Press, contacted Christopher Hitchens, British-American publicist and journalist, and asked him to write a forward to the paperback of my memoir, Infidel. And in the first paragraph of his foreword, 
Hitchens addresses what he calls the modern world's most imposing new realities, cross-border and cross-cultural migration. He interviewed me for that forward. And then I asked him, what is it, can you please tell me, what is it in Europeans and Americans that fascinates them about my life? And he said, being forthright and just being himself, <laughs> because <laughs> he said, because you are an embodiment of this cross-border and cross-cultural migration. You have crossed all these borders, become a successful member of Western society, paid the price of rejection, you adhere to the principles you chose for yourself, and, and this is Christopher's line, and you are still sane. <laughs> I appreciate his forth forthrightness, or I would not accept his friendship. What he was saying essentially, as I took it, was, I am, you have no exceptional qualities as a scholar, <laughs> as an artist, a musician, you don't, you don't excel in physics, you fled from politics, because when you saw how much intrigue was involved, this is me interpreting him, he didn't say this. You fled from politics, not an athlete, not a doctor. So what is my claim to fame or infamy? It's only that I crossed borders, crossed cultures, and didn't end up in a mental asylum? <laughs> well, he said, you made a choice between the values you were brought up with and those of the country you adopted, and you don't seem as conflicted as most modern Western Muslims. And each time I hear the conflict between Islam and the West and take note of attempts at resolving them, I remember one of my experiences as an interpreter in Holland. I was called one day to an elementary school in The Hague to translate for a couple whose seven-year-old firstborn son named Mohammed had beaten another child, a native Dutch white child. I forgot this child's name, so I'll just call him Mark. Mohammed and Mark's parents were upset, felt misunderstood, had been yelling at each other, one set in Somali, the other set in Dutch. And now the school was trying to resolve the conflict by bringing in a translator, me. A teacher, looking very serious at Mohammed's parents, said, Mohammed is very aggressive. He hit Mark, he kicked him, he punched him in the face and threatened to kill him. Seven-year-old. Mohammed's mother says, it's Mark's fault. He called him a bad name, poked his tongue at him, and made fun of him. The teacher went on to say, yeah, but it's Mohammed who hit him first. Mohammed's father and mother cried in unison, of course, you don't wait to be hit first. <laughs> we taught him to punch any child in the face who so much as gives him a wrong look. The Dutch teacher, now stunned and almost speechless, it's the first time I came to understand what it meant to look pale. She looked at the parents and cried in Dutch. I hope there are some people who, if you're not of Dutch origin, at least understand it. And she said, you fooled him up that geweld the oplossing is. Are you breeding him to believe that violence is the way to solve conflict? Given the mutual bewilderment of both of my clients at each other, I asked if I could stop, if I could step out of my neutral role as an interpreter of text alone and venture into cultural interpretation, translate the context. 
I explained to the parents that they were no longer in Somalia, but in Holland now. The way to resolve conflict was by learning to talk. Talk till you drop. <laughs> talk, mediate, avoid each other, or go to court, where a lot of talking is done by people called lawyers. <laughs> who represent you and your interests. And all the talking ends up in a settlement pronounced by a judge who talks. <laughs> and I have a judge friend there. <laughs> and I know he talks. <laughs> no special skills were required in punching in the face, no kicking, no biting, no stabbing or shooting. And beside the curriculum of math, language, and geography, kids were taught how to develop the skills of talking one's way out of problems, one's way into college, one's way into jobs, one's way into love, and one's way out of love, and so on. <laughs> to the Dutch teacher, I explained that in Somalia, strong clans teach their children, both boys and girls, how to be aggressive. My older cousin used to take me to fighting practice, not football practice, after school. I was about five or six years old, and I was encouraged to pick a fight with a classmate who was encouraged to pick a fight with me. We poked our tongues at each other, made faces at each other, <laughs> and called each other names like you are accursed, you are a coward, shameful, dishonorable, kintirle, you with the long hanging clitoris. And then, surrounded by cheering older relatives, we went at each other. We kicked and scratched and took bites at each other. We wrestled till we were full of bruises, our little dresses torn, our knees scraped from falling. You were defeated if you gave up first, or if you cried, or if you ran away. And in all three cases, you would undergo a severe verbal and physical beating from your fighting coach. This anecdote is one of numerous clashes on different levels that I witnessed between Westerners and people with whom I share a tribal or religious background. And by this, ladies and gentlemen, I do not want to create the impression in your mind that all people from Muslim countries or tribal societies are aggressive. They are not. Despite Hitchens' remark about adopting Western values and remaining sane, I am not the only one. There are thousands of men and women who are able to appreciate Western culture in all its facets. There are also many Westerners who reject their own cultures of freedom, who cultivate fundamentalism, collectivist dogmas, and a naive and romantic belief in the merits of pre-medieval life. They're called anthropologists, mainly. <laughs> that is completely perverted. <laughs> My grandmother's culture, as I like to call it, or I have come to call it, differs from the culture I encountered in Holland in many ways. But I'd like to discuss only the three that I consider to be the most important. One, the individual versus the group, that difference. The second difference is that between men and women and the position of women in society. And finally, the state versus the group, the clan, and the state and religion. That's all intertwined. In tribal Muslim societies, the rights of the collective are far more important than those of the individual. Group survival depends on the, on the ability of individuals to conform. What we are required to conform to, unlike you, are customs, habits, traditions, and superstitions that have been practiced by our forefathers and their forefathers. Islam was founded in an Arab tribal desert society in the 7th century. It unified different groups who were fighting. 
It elevated those ideas and customs that were considered to be good to divine level. For instance, the concept of honor and shame was a regulating mechanism and still is the regulating mechanism in Arab tribal society in the early centuries. Islamic theology, founded by an Arab man, Muhammad, decreed any shameful behavior to be sinful. But it was a shameful behavior that was already considered shameful. Whatever the tribes considered honorable, he declared virtuous or godly behavior. It is honorable for an individual to do everything that will improve and will advance the interests of his family and his clan or tribe. The only addition that Islam made is instead of limiting the clan or the tribe to blood relations, it created a new tribe or polity called the Ummah, a polity of believers. Loyalty after Islam was founded was no longer enforced by an appeal to the bloodline, but by an appeal to God. Group norms were made divine and now considered revealed truth from God. By founding Islam, Muhammad united his tribesmen, but preserved in many ways their tribal way of life. The tribal way of life is very different from what we now call the open society or Western society. And I find one of the biggest differences to be that between men and women. Everything in tribal life centers around female sexuality. For a tribe or a clan to be strong, to be the one to hit first, to conquer, to prosper, to expand, the male must be confident that the children he's raising, especially the boys, are of his sperm. Revenge is a very powerful instrument. And in a culture of aggressive conquest and counter-conquests, the single most important anxiety is revenge. You are always looking over your shoulder to see if someone you've slighted or members of your kinship have offended are about to stab you in the back. Vigilance and treachery are the arts of survival. The concept of enemy, of insiders and outsiders, of us and they, is very, very strong. Women are seen to be the weakest link. And often, you marry the woman of tribes you have conquered, and they may not forget that, the women. Conflict does not have to be between your, your intimate tribe and a faraway tribe. It can be between two brothers, two cousins, second cousins. To ensure that you will not be betrayed by your own child, you have to be certain that you are the sole master of the wombs of your women. So much importance is put into the virginity of brides. The Muslim marriage contract makes a distinction between virgin, divorced, and widow. You will not understand it as an outsider unless you understand the tribal context of this, that your entire survival depends on it. Girls and women are programmed with safeguarding their virginity, their wombs, denying their sexuality. It's the price of honor the woman has to pay. If she doesn't, she will not be protected. Worse, she could be killed. So when you and I recently, when you as Westerners, learn about practices such as female genital mutilation, forced marriages, the confinement of women, the veiling, you have to think about these things in that context, patriarchal tribal culture. So there is that difference between the individual and the collective, men and women. And then finally, I come to the third aspect, which is the state slash clan slash religion. After the decolonization process, the Arab Muslim countries that were so-called liberated had the notion of the state nation was imposed on them. And this happened without going through a process of detribalization. 
the institutions of the mother country, the model society of the mother countries to which only a small group of elites educated by Westerns, Westerners had been introduced. But society at large was not groomed to accept this. When members of tribes or clans are dissatisfied with the nation states as they inherited them from the British, the French and so on, they fall back on the bloodline. Fathers and sons, brothers and cousins. That's where you seek your survival. Survival is mere subsistence. And it leads to a burning desire for salvation. And salvation is provided by Islamic theology that simplifies the world into us versus them and into an array of do's and don'ts. The leaders of the established nation states use Islam and Islamic theology as a way of preserving their authority. The opposition to them uses Islamic theology to declare them un-Islamic. The mechanisms of acquiring power and proposing an improved form of society all goes through Islamic theology. The state and religion become one. When I lived in Somalia and in Saudi Arabia and even in Ethiopia and Kenya, the world was bipolar. There was a balance of power between the Soviet Union and the United States. I grew up in a home where we were politically literate because my father was a politician. And every time some of my relatives would defend the merits of American democracy, others would defend the merits of the communism of the Soviet Union. But the majority of my relatives, my kinsmen, my neighbors, would always defend the merits of the clan and pronounce how supreme Islamic law or Islamic Sharia was. Then I came to Holland. I came to Holland because I did not want to be a wife to a man who was only interested in my womb as a factory of his children. And the products of that factory would be boys or girls. If they were girls, he would take another wife. And not only would I be his slave, but he would always look at me with contempt for bearing girls. In our first meeting, he said, you are going to have six sons for me. I was in search of something I didn't know. I just had a clue of it. Me as more than just a vagina or a womb. Me as my mind, as my skin, as my dreams, as my goals. Me as a contributor to society besides getting pregnant and giving birth. My sister used to say, was more rebellious than I was, I have not lived because I have not mattered. And I wanted to matter. And that's the first difference between the West and where I come from, which is the place of the individual versus the collective. How much can I matter? And how much can I matter without causing the group, my collective, my community, to think of me as mattering too much to silence me? And how much could I matter as a female? without causing fitna or chaos? And how much of me and how I wanted to matter was God's business, my family's business, or mine? The answer that Holland gave me was, well, darling, they call you schatje, it's little darling. We don't care about your womb, it's yours. Conform to society, not on the terms of the bloodline, but on the terms of paying taxes, participating as a volunteer, participating in government, taking part in demonstrations, writing critical articles, but do not rock the boat too much, which unfortunately for me, I did. Probably because, as Somalis, the only boats that we are familiar with are used to pirate. <laughs> I, I didn't know at the time. 
Holland is six feet underwater and all they can talk about, all idioms are related to water. I couldn't even swim when I got there. <laughs> Still can't swim. <laughs> the relationship between individuals and the group, between men and women, between the state and religion is extremely different when it comes to the Western Islam. It's also different in an interesting way within the West. For instance, between America and Holland. Americans are more individualist, the Dutch more conformist. American women and men have a different idea of equality between men and women. The Tocqueville noticed it, what, 200 years ago? It's a hole in my knowledge. <laughs> they tend to marry more than the Dutch do, for instance. And Americans are always solving problems. Where many Dutch people simply resign and accept their situation or just leave it to the state. And the state is less prominent here in the United States in the lives of Americans than it is in the lives of Dutch men and women. The differences between America and Europe are not so dramatic as to cause between them any war but there are differences in quality, quality of life, and perhaps a theory which you can test and see which one lasts longer. The differences between Islam and the West, on the other hand, the values of Islam and the values of Islamic theology, measured by using as criteria the position of the individual, the relationship between men and women, the nation state, and the place of religion and the tribe is not only different and not only an interesting different, it clashes and it is clashing now as we sit here. Now let's go back to the story of Mohammed and Mark. Mohammed is groomed to be aggressive, not to compromise, to protect the womb of the women of his kinsmen at all costs. He's brought up with the idea that he has enemies, with the idea of victory and defeat, shame and honor. Mark is brought up with the idea of compromise and conformity, respect for the decision of his womenfolk. The idea that there are no enemies because you can talk it out. Without globalization, without immigration, without the fact that we are in ever closer proximity, with each other and between these values and cultures, Mohammed and Mark's lives would each have taken their own course. Oops. But in reality, in our reality, they come together and sometimes they collide. It's about this collision that we have to think about. Whose ideas, whose values, whose way of life prevails? The answer to that question is very important. I belong to the fortunate few who are intimately exposed to both and I have made my choice. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have questions, we have uh, two of our student ambassadors here with uh, handheld mics. If you raise your hand, they'll get the microphones to you. Ayan, um, my 80-year-old mother-in-law just read, recently read your book, and she wanted to ask you if you believe that Islam is capable of undergoing the kind of enlightenment that, for example, Christianity did. It's very important when we are talking about Islam to make a distinction between Islam as a set of beliefs and Muslims as individuals who are either born into Islam or somehow are introduced 
to those sets of ideas. If I believe strongly that Muslims as individuals can reconcile themselves with modernity, with liberalism, with democracy, with whatever idea. And by doing so, will relinquish much of what is demanded of them in Islamic theology. But if I take Islamic theology separately as a set of ideas, and I offset them against classical liberalism, against what? The ideas of socialism, or the ideas of communism, or the ideas of Catholicism, I'll find there very many differences. And the set of ideas that I find that Islam collides the most with is liberalism. But not Muslims as individuals. I was born into an Islamic society and I am where I am because I have a mind of my own and I believe that every single Muslim person, every single Russian or Chinese, every single human being has a mind of his or her own. How much of it is challenged? Yeah. I have two questions. First, what is the current status of where you're living right now? I'm under the impression that the Dutch government is no longer offering you protection. Secondly, where has um, the American media been in promoting your cause? Where has Oprah Winfrey, Ellen DeGeneres, uh, Katie Couric, you strike a multicultural ideal that their world uh, puts on a pedestal, yet somehow Christopher Hitchens seems to be the only person in American popular culture that seems to be um, representing you. What are, have you noticed that? Those are my two questions. Pop culture and uh, your current resident status and, and if you're being protected properly. Goodness. <laughs> and, and I say that. In, in Holland I remember saying once, Jesus, and then this guy comes behind me and tells me, do you want to convert? <laughs> so I thought I will just say goodness. Uh, I have to be very vague on that, A, because revealing where I live is about the worst thing I can do. I live in the United States. But I can't, I'm not going to tell you where I live. Second, the Dutch government has stopped paying for my security as of the 1st of October 2007, and ever since the American Enterprise Institute's president, Chris Demuth, former president now, reached out to as many donors as he can. And so if you want to donate to my security, you donate to the American, in American Enterprise Institute and you say this is just for her security and they'll administer that because it's a 501c3. It's a <laughs> bureaucratic term I've just learned about. And, and with that, with those donations, we are able to finance uh, the gentleman you see around. And then finally on pop culture, I've been in contact when I was in Holland uh, with Time, and they put me on their list of Time 100 most influential blah 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 blah. Um, <laughs> I've been interviewed by 60 Minutes, I've been on the Bill Maher show, the Colbert Report and so on. Um, but there's a catch to, I've not been on Oprah and the, other, the others you mentioned, which I hope the longer I am, after learning the American Constitution, I'll be introduced to, to <laughs> the other names. <laughs> uh, but there's a catch-22, which is the more publicity I seek, the more I put myself in danger. So as long as my security, my personal security is taken care of, then I'm able to go out and go into pop culture. But again, I have a message that is not, um, yeah, it, it's not appealing to pop culture. It's, like I said, you, you can't matter too much. Don't rock the boat. And I think a lot of people who operate in public culture um, do not, still have not worked out for themselves what their position is toward Islam and the position of Islamic women. Hold it. Here you go. 
Well, first, thank you very much. We saw, I'm having a uh, large dose of you. I saw you last night in the third jihad, which was a movie, and that was very good. And your, spoke, and your statements were good. My question is, uh, we are currently in a Mark Mohammed situation uh, with the clash of civilizations that you mentioned. What is your advice, or if you were president, what would you do in confronting Islam, a radical Islam, currently? I'm not president. <laughs> I, d I didn't like politics when I was in it. Um, another feature, really striking feature between Europe and the United States for me is that America is not only about a creed, a creed of freedom, that I'm, I'm beginning to understand and to learn, but it's also about its suspicion towards government. American, America is a civil society, civil activism. In Europe, we rely on government. In order to fight any collectivist threat to that American creed, what you see is American individuals questioning it. Who was Karl Marx? What was his message? If we take his ideas to their logical consequence, how will society look like? We, in the United States and in Europe, have asked ourselves these questions. Now, the next thing is we need to do the same, given the fact that the challenge, the collision we are facing in the 21st century is with Islam, of whom there are 1.2 to 1.5 adherents. I think it's high time that we start to ask ourselves, who was Muhammad? What did he say? How did the society that he proposed look like and how does it differ from ours? What's his, his creed as opposed to ours? How much of it is religion? How much of it is politics? And how do we deal with that? And we are all shying away from that. Americans probably because there is this natural attitude of respect towards religion, any religion, and Europeans, because they just don't know what to do. So ask, who is Muhammad? What does he, why? To the Muslim, Muhammad is infallible because he believes in him as an icon. But if you're a Christian or an atheist like me, or a Jewish person, or whatever, Buddhist. You can just sit down in your study room and wonder who, who was Muhammad. Goodness. <laughs> Mark Stein, the uh, columnist, has written, I'm over here. Uh, Mark Stein has uh, written about the demographic suicide of Europe. Generally, the Muslim countries don't have any notion in the Western sense of democracy, and so their leaders make pronouncements that may or may not reflect the will of the people. And in particular, in Iran, uh, President Ahmadinejad is regularly calling for the annihilation of Israel and the development of Islamic nuclear weapons. So it appears, from my perspective, that the Muslim world is on the move and the Western world doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot to defend itself. Do you foresee any way to resolve this short of some sort of a violent conflict between the Western powers and the Islamic powers? And by Islamic powers, I don't mean the general individuals in Muslim countries who uh, may not agree with their leaders, but the political powers who are calling for such things as the destruction of Israel. I mean, again, the, the core of um, my talk tonight was, we, if you don't understand tribal society, if, if we don't, and I really mean this, in tribal society, whether it, there's, it, it doesn't matter how much Islamic theology is in it, the more that's in it, the more Sharia is introduced into conflict, Islamic law is introduced into conflict, the harder it gets. But in principle, reality is, for those of us who are brought up in a tribal society, we don't know things like contracts and talking. We know what revenge is, we know what aggression is, we know how to defend ourselves against it. The nation state, as it's introduced, in most 
Muslim countries except Indonesia and Turkey is an instrument of those few people who want power and who want to preserve it. And every time they do that by introducing Islamic theology, not because they believe in it. Saddam Hussein was not a Muslim. He was a declared atheist. But when it suited him, he put there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger on the Iraqi flag because he knew the only viable opposition to him in Iraq were Islamists. The opposition themselves use Islamic theology to oppose their, um, their government. So first of all, before we go sit at a table and have a peace treaty and start signing contracts and all of that, we have to understand the dynamics and the context of that world. We're not talking about Democrats. On the hand, one hand, we're talking about despots who want to preserve their power. And on the other hand, we're talking about oppositional groups who are seeking answers in a 7th century, 8th century theology. And I think first, let's, yeah, we, we need to have a proper understanding of that before we proceed to develop a strategic foreign policy that will bring about peace in these regions. And you talked about Israel today and Netanyahu. I think if the American president goes on and forces a peace treaty down Israel's throat, what you're going to have is a piece of paper. You're not going to have peace. You just have a paper declaring we have peace because people on the other side don't. I, I hope it works out to peace and the more we postpone it, the more dire things get and then we end up in wars that we are ill prepared for. The 11th of September hit most politicians, most academics, most journalists, and most American citizens as a complete surprise. And I'm saying most. There were few people, but they just weren't listened to because it wasn't seen as a problem. And we can reverse that because we now have that experience of the 11th of September. Wherever the mic is. <laughs> Thank you for your comments. I have uh, two questions. Uh, is there a country that you see, maybe Malaysia, maybe Morocco, uh, you mentioned Turkey, where um, religion uh, uh, works in a, in a free and fair government system? And, and, I, and I don't know, that, that's an open question. And then um, I want to take you from the Middle East to uh, East Africa, where you're from. And it seems to me uh, constant civil wars, constant refugees, um, a horrible health care system, uh, lots and lots of poverty. Um, just a small question. What's the solution <laughs> um, of basically sub-Saharan Africa? And um, see, it seems to me there might be only one country that I can think of that's had 50 years of reasonable um, fair elections and, and, and no civil war. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about Ghana, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on, on the whole region and solutions. That's, that's, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I can act as a prophet. <laughs> Just come and solve all the problems in the world. Uh, I have, I, I'll start with the second question. I have met a woman from Zambia at the last time 100 dinner called Dambisa Moyo, who wrote a book called Dead Aid. And where she, she, she used to work for the World Bank, um, is at Oxford University now, and studied at Harvard. And she, it's a very small book, but it's an account of everything that went wrong in Africa and what aid to Africa, uh, financial help, from rich Western countries has done to Africa, that it has achieved the exact opposite uh, results of what was required. Trillions of dollars have been poured into Africa. There's nothing to show for it. If anything, it's poorer, more diseases, more terrible. And I think that she is someone who will be able to answer that question much better than I do. I wasn't focusing on Africa uh, since I left it. But I completely agree with her. 
I completely agree with the idea. It's, not, it's just like the welfare system in Europe, where immigrants come in, people are not taught about their rights, rights are introduced to them as if they are entitlements, then you have these entitlements, you're on welfare for a decade, two, and then suddenly everything turns around and you're told you should go and work, and you don't understand why they're suddenly making these demands. And so then you still consider yourself a victim. And I think the same sort of dynamic, the same sort of pathological relationship between the giver of charity and the receiver of charity is what's been going on in Africa. And to make matters worse in Africa, all these monies were given mostly to governments that were not elected, and even if they were elected, were not efficient governments, and so they could get away with it. That's the story in Africa. In Indonesia and in Turkey, both democracies, corrupt democracies, <laughs> democracies with lots and lots of problems. Democratic form of government is a problematic form of government, and both countries do not have a long history of democratic practice. But religion, again, in both countries, Islam, comes as a form of opposition. If politicians are corrupt and they don't provide what they promise, then religious groups the Islamic Brotherhood movement, both in Turkey and in Indonesia, probably stronger in Indonesia, and a lot of Saudi money, uh, not just from Saudi Arabia, but Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, rich individuals from the Gulf, put a lot of money into creating religious schools or madrasas. It's, a, it's become a form of Arab Islamic imperialism that's very successful, that you can see in Pakistan. In both countries, that kind of radical Islamism and political Islam as a way of opposition has taken place. And in fact, in Turkey, as far as, I mean, I think I consider the current government, the current ruling party in Turkey to be more Islamist than true to the ideas of Ataturk, the secular ideas of Ataturk. So in both countries, you see, yes, an elite uh, that could sit here but also uh, an Islamized mass in the religions and in the, in the regions, in the rural areas. And how that's going to play itself out is, uh, yeah, it, it will, will, especially in Turkey, which is more dramatic, we'll see within a matter of them. Turkey used to be pro-Israel, is no longer pro-Israel. Used to be pro-America, is no longer that. Um, wanted to join the EU on EU terms. And now things look like <laughs> as if the EU is going to join Turkey. Very interesting developments to see. Yeah. Yeah. This will be the final question. Thank you very much. The Judeo Christian paradigm for the relationship between God and man is free will. In contrast, in Islam, it's submission to the will of Allah. Uh, the former intrinsically democratic, the latter intrinsically, it seems, fascistic. And that theme expounded upon by Matthias Kunzel, the German political philosopher, who ironically is a leftist and atheist, but a friend of Israel and democracy. Given the inherent, profound, seemingly irreconcilable clash between a spiritualism centered around free will and the other disciplined by submission of an imposition of will, what hope is there really for reconciliation between the, cult, uh, the cult civilizations, much less even reformation uh, within Islam? The answer to that question is about the most difficult to give because, I mean, we can analyze as much as we like, but we can't, it, I find it very hard to predict the future. What I can see is that those who believe in the submission of will and in the God that demands submission of will, of the human will, are far more convinced about the ideas, are willing to invest in it, not just money, 
and resources, but also their own lives. And they're being rewarded for those convictions and that hard work. Westerners, Europeans or Americans, go to the rest of the globe and give a lot of charity. But all that non-governmental action and activism, I want to say not all, most of it, is most of, it, most of the secular or Judeo-Christian charity from America and Europe is provided as something that is value neutral. We will come and we'll help you build roads, hospitals, we'll help you this way or that way, but you can keep your customs, you can keep your culture, you don't have to adopt our values. Wealthy Arab Islamic countries, China, Russia, if they do give anything at all, they will do it first and foremost in the interest of their own states and their own people. And whatever they give is not value neutral. Strings are attached. I'll build you a mosque, but you convert to Islam. I'll build you a hospital, but you convert to Islam. And unless we take on that competition, we're not going to win that war. And it's not something that government should do. We are, as Americans and Europeans, present more, more than any other force, everywhere, all over the world. But we're just presenting ourselves and marketing ourselves as being value neutral. And unless we change that, we're not going to win.